Hey everybody, this is Eric Mueller, the host of The Eric Mueller Show. You're tuned into the podcast that explores what makes any successful person's inner clock tick by unlocking the most impactful tools within their success portfolio. I'm joined today by Katie Harris, the founder and CEO of Nursepreneurs, a mentorship program that's empowered thousands of nurses. How do they do that? She's teaching nurses how to monetize their knowledge, develop business skills, and help healthcare delivery evolve. She's driven to undo the perception that nursing is limited to just the hospital setting. Let's head on over to the interview. Katie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on here because this, this, you know, I come from a healthcare background. I practice in pharmacy right now. I'm sure we have a lot of pharmacists, a lot of doctors, a lot of nurses listening that are really already feeling empowered by just, you know, the introduction of what your Nursepreneurs does for nursing. So before we really get into that entrepreneurial story, Katie, we want to know what makes up your success portfolio. So if you're new to this show listening, a really quick background and way to view this is to think of your investment portfolio. Think of your stocks, you know, your 401k, the things that lead to that financial future that you have in store for yourself and builds that foundation. Well, here on the Eric Mueller Show, I really want to discover how successful people like Katie invest in themselves and build that foundation for their success as a whole. So Katie, start us off. What are some skills or traits, habits or mindsets that make up that success portfolio? Uh, So one of the biggest things that I had to give myself was just space and time. Um, Those are what I feel like the two most valuable and key components of entrepreneurship, Uh, because as a nurse, especially, and I know a lot of nurses that do this, if you know, if I have an empty hour somewhere in my day, like I feel it, like I find ways to fill every second of my day. And when I became an entrepreneur, that became extremely um, just hazardous. Like I couldn't move forward. I couldn't get anything done. And I, I just kept spinning my wheels. And, and finally, one of my mentors is like, you need to slow down to speed up, basically. You know, it sounds cliche, but it was exactly, he was exactly right. So now I don't take calls um, before 11 a.m. Like I just, I need that space. I'm a morning person. I worked neurosurgery for 20 years. So I was up, you know, in the hospital at 5 a.m. Um, and so my best time is between like six and nine. And I just, I can't be interrupted. That's like my sacred time. So it's the time that I can think and process and sometimes just do nothing. Sometimes I'm stare at a wall, but you know, it's like, it's helpful. It helps me to, to, for the rest of my day to be more organized. Yeah, I think that's a really impactful thing to start off with. And Katie, another piece to kind of the success portfolio is really like, what is your definition of success? So if you're, you know, you're building towards a future, you want to know where you're going, you want to know what the point B is when you start off at point A. Have you found that your definition has changed over time? And what would you define success to be right now? Yeah, I mean, it's always a moving target. And, you know, seven years ago, when I started this, I remember, my mentor had me pull out a dollar bill and write my dream, you know, amount of money that I would make. And, you know, that number at that point was $10,000 a month. Like that was more money than I'd ever seen in my life. I thought that was like unattainable. It was a pipe dream, whatever. And, you know, I still have that dollar with that written on. Now my, you know, I have programs that cost $10,000. Like it, it's so far, we're so far past that 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 target just keeps moving. Like what's the next, the next kind of like unimaginable, unattainable thing is like nine figures, right? Like we'll never get there. It's too far away. Uh, So yeah, success, there's, there's certainly the monetary value, but you know, from a a personal standpoint, one of the things that I really want to do is uh, take my son over to Switzerland for high school, right? And that we spend high school over there together and he goes to this nice private high school and I stay there and I maybe work from there and ski in the afternoon. So that's my new definition of success. <laughs> I have got three years to get to that. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And and it, and I think it's it's okay to for people to realize that you can change your definition over time. It can mold. It can kind of ebb and flow as time goes on. So yeah, where it is right now for you, who's to say in the future, maybe maybe it'll change in ways that you don't even expect that are, that are even better. So I, I think one other piece that I think is really important as we kind of start to talk about nursepreneurs and what you're doing as an entrepreneur 
is really the, the burnout in the healthcare profession as a whole. Could we just spend a few minutes just talking a little bit about burnout, what it leads to, why is it caused, and maybe specifically what your uh, belief is on why nurses in particular are burnt out today? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to answer this question by um, going back a little bit because uh, I was I worked in neurosurgery again for like 20 years. I love this. This was my family. We had a culture there. We, you know, I knew everybody in every department, every service line, you know, for everybody. And it was wonderful. I, would, I didn't take vacation for years because I couldn't even imagine you know, not going into work. Um, and it was just so far beyond my comprehension. And so, you know, working, I worked long hours too. Like I never wanted the resident, I didn't want to let the residents down. I didn't want to pass off the work that I had to do, but it's, it's a 24 seven job. You know, you, you have to, <laughs> you have to hand it off. But um, one of the things that I saw was, you know, the residents, they grow up and, you know, one med student that I knew then graduated and took a directorship and, you know, started making a million dollars upon graduation. And it was my role to go back to the new med student, the new intern and start all over again and see them grow up again. And I couldn't evolve in my space. Like I couldn't ever grow beyond that particular job role. Um, the hospital didn't want it. The, you know, neurosurgery didn't want it. They didn't want me to, um, you know, like make a jump forward, right? They wanted me just to keep doing what I was doing. And that might be fine for some people, but it was extremely painful for me. And it started to like eat away. And it really caused me to, uh, you know, I started, it, it started manifesting for me anyway, as like, resentment and irritability and I was hostile and I'd come into work literally walk into the hospital and be immediately angry and people would be like oh Katie how are you and I'm like what do you want you know and then eventually it was just like I don't like myself you know I don't like this person who I've become and when I look back at it I see that as burnout and a, a big part of that for me was having I didn't see the importance of my role in a lot of ways. And I didn't see the purpose. So, you know, if I left the hospital, like what kind of legacy did I leave? Like I had absolutely nothing to show for 20 years of working with neurosurgery. Yeah. And through that, like 20 plus year career as a practicing nurse, you also connected with a lot of other nurses that had fresh ideas and didn't feel like they had a place to grow them. Maybe led to some feelings of being brushed aside or feeling demoralized in some ways. Do you think there's some type of systematic problem, like a medical hierarchy that is maybe set up to limit the potential growth? Maybe, maybe not intentionally, but it's a limited cap on like how far a nurse might be able to go, how far a pharmacist might be able to go, you know, even to, in, even to a physician, how far they might be able to advance. Do you think there's some type of uh, systematic issue at hand there? Yeah, I, I do think it's systemic and I don't think it's necessarily intentional. Uh, you know, the, the, I think that doctors have have set the bar. And, you know, it's something that I think a lot of us should follow because they come into the medical space and assume leadership. They just assume they're going to be the, the director. They assume they're going to be this, that, or the other thing. And so they get what they assume, you know, whereas nurses, and maybe the same is for pharmacists, I don't know, but, um, you know, we work real, 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 real hard. And then we hope, 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 hope that you'll get like a one-step promotion at some point in your 20 course career. That's what I was hoping. And it never happened. But, um, you know, and I never had that assumption that I belonged in leadership. I felt like I had to prove myself a thousand times before I was worthy of like one step up, let alone like a jump, uh, you know, or a leap across, um, you know, the, the healthcare spectrum. And, you know, I think that they've done that very well. Uh, I don't think it was intentional, but it certainly exists. Um and it's it's rough. It's it's rough for for all of us uh, not to have a growth pattern and a growth like career ladder. Yeah, I can I can just echo too, Katie, on that part from the pharmacist standpoint. I mean, it does feel like that, at least in my opinion, as well. You know, if you're in a hospital setting, you know, the pharmacist d definitely doesn't probably feel like the top, you know, person per se because you got the physician, and you know, in, in terms of like what you're able to do from a practicing standpoint as well. A lot of pharmacists don't have provider status. So, I mean, that's, you know, kind of in the pharmacist community, a, a bit of a, a limiting factor there. And I think also with in, in regard to just healthcare as a profession, you're taught throughout school a lot of ways to do things, you know, a lot of black and white ways to solve a problem. 
And leadership, as I'm sure you found out, is not really that type of thing. It's a gray area. There's not necessarily an answer. Most of the time, there probably is not a straightforward answer when you're having to make a big decision. And you, in your bio, you mentioned that you wanted to be a nurse from a very young age. You know, you were in your teen years and you had this vivid, you know, dream of wanting to practice nursing. At what point did that maybe change or at one point did that maybe at least mold where you, you felt like entrepreneurship was maybe the way to, to really feel more fulfilled and maybe practicing nursing in a traditional sense was not necessarily for you? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I definitely think there's a, a very large definition of nursing. So I still consider myself uh, nursing, even though it's not at the bedside of nursing, uh, you know, nurses in their careers. But um, at, at one point during that time where I was really just kind of like not happy, one of the, the things that I did was I made a change in the unit, I made a change in the hospital. And for a couple of months, yeah, I mean, it was it was new, it was exciting, but it, then it turned out to be the same old, same old, same old. Um, and then one day, just completely randomly, out of the blue, uh, Walmart calls me, and I was at the time I was the acute care nurse practitioner director for the college that was associated with my university, and they said, "Oh, we're looking for a nurse practitioner to take over, um, you know, this position, recruiting nurse practitioners into our clinics because they had clinics down south." And I was like, please, Jesus, take me. <laughs> like, you have to take me. Like, I want to do it. Like, please, I'm not going to tell anybody about this position. I'm going to hoard all this information for myself. I'm the only applicant putting forward here. And uh, they did, uh, they did hire me. And my role was basically to connect with nurses uh, across the US. And then I ended up connecting with nurses across the globe. And it was incredible. And I learned so many amazing stories, which is what uh, precipitated the podcast because I was so fascinated. I met this one woman, her name is Diana Mason. She's a, she's a nurse and she had, had started her own radio and this a radio show, not a radio, but a radio show. And she's like, yeah, I just started a radio show. And this blew my mind. I'm like, what do you mean? You just, you can't just start a radio show. Like nobody does. That. <laughs> like I've never heard of such a thing. And she's like, yeah, you just you just do it. And so I'm like, no, 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 I, I need you to break this down for me. So and that's what we did. And that was my very first podcast episode. And then I was so fascinated by that, you know, I started looking for other nurses and what they were doing. And um, so that was how I kind of got into entrepreneurship, because I really was fascinated by their stories. And I'm like, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, so that so the podcast actually was born prior to the nursepreneurs uh, community, like budding, and you actually becoming the founder of what is now the company Nursepreneurs, right? Yeah, I mean, it it, it started out as a, the, one of the reasons I started um, going down this path too is because in order to recruit nurse practitioners, I was like, oh, I should start a blog, and then I was like, well, I don't know how to start a blog, so I went online and. Uh, embarrassingly enough, I had to say uh, by two, 2015, I had no idea there was such a thing as online courses, but I found this online course and ordered it and, and learned how to start a blog. But as I was doing the blog, I got involved in other people's courses and that just started a, a mountain of like, you know, <laughs> educational debt that I started to acquire over the years. Um, but I learned, um, you know, that you could start these different types of businesses and I was just fascinated by it. So, and have you found it in terms of learning post nursing school, has that become easier for you? Do you find, I'm trying to, to speak to the people that are maybe already done with a fair amount of school and they might think, I don't really know if I'm able to learn in that way. Like I'm kind of maybe not set in my ways, but I've done enough school where if I have to do something, you know, totally out of the box. It might throw me off. It might discourage me. Did you find that to be more challenging or less challenging as you were learning the entrepreneurial uh, skill set? Uh, well, I, I definitely have uh, entrepreneurial ADD. Uh, I love to learn things, and if I could just learn things and that be my job, that's probably what I would do. Because I would, you know, study. I I could go down all different rabbit holes. Love them absolutely. And I typically buy like. 50 books on whatever topic that I'm learning about and read all of them in, in like a week. Um, so that part of being an entrepreneur, now, all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, I need to learn marketing and I need to learn business and I need to learn this and this and this and this and this. And I loved that. Um, but, but when I started teaching nurses how to set up their business, I realized they did not love that. <laughs> and most small business owners don't love um, that aspect of it. Like they have this expertise and they want it streamlined. But what I've been able to do is take all of this uh, knowledge and expertise and all of the money that I've spent on masterminds and education. I mean, I've spent 
I probably could have a really nice condo in, in Mexico for what I've spent on education. But, you know, um, I feel like I can take that now and really streamline the process for people. Yeah. And, and this probably is a perfect segue into just nursepreneurs as a business. You know, you have the courses, the coaching, a community of over 14,000 nurses. You've helped launch, you know, several hundred businesses. Explain to us really what nursepreneurs is and, and what solution it provides specifically for the nurses out there that, that want more and that want to kind of branch into that entrepreneurial space. Yeah, it was really about helping them see that they have an extremely valuable skill set and an expertise that can be packaged, priced, and positioned into a business model. Uh, I remember going to mastermind events and people would talk about how they, I don't know, their friend had fibromyalgia. So now they have this coaching business and they teach people about fibromyalgia and they're doing like a million dollars a year and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, you know, that's what we deal with all day, every day. Like the, the nurses should be doing that. They have like after three or four years, they already have that 10,000 hours of, of um, you know, working with patients and hearing their stories. Like we hear so much, we know so much um, and we see it from so many different angles. Um, so I, I felt like that was a really important message to get out. But one of the hurdles there, and you kind of we're just talking about this, one of the hurdles is, okay, I've got this expertise, I've got these great ideas, but how do I turn this into anything without breaking the bank, without wasting my time, you know, without, um, you know, all the negative things that, that go with business. Uh, and that's what we, we really wanted to do is show them how, let's say, an oncology nurse could turn that expertise into a business. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's really a good way to, to view, you know, the foray into, into entrepreneurship, I think, as a whole for a healthcare professional, because you're probably dealing with a person that is working full time, and they've mm -hmm. spent a considerable amount of time and money to train for that degree. And they probably also do appreciate some of the stability of having a W-2 job. So a, yes. lot, of those, a lot of those factors, I, I was speaking with a previous guest recently, and he, he basically mentioned, when you think about entrepreneurship, think about it like that paycheck that comes into your bank account either every week or every two weeks or every month, just imagine that's stopping right now. That's, that is going into entrepreneurship. And so it's scary. You know, yeah. it, it, could be, it could be a very high risky endeavor. What advice have you given nurses that are maybe a little nervous about even spending additional time, you know, outside of work on something that is maybe not their family or their friends or other hobbies that maybe they're not necessarily trying to monetize? But they enjoy. What 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 would you say to them? You know, to maybe encourage them to, you know, maybe think about entrepreneurship or maybe not. Yeah. No. I mean, I think if you have a, a passion for something, you have a solution for other people that, um, and you really enjoy working in that space. Um, you know, there's there's lots of ways to um, take it and harness it into something. And I would definitely not quit your your day job, like you need to have a minimal viable product. And it's helpful if you sell a couple, you know, people, um, I know they, they freak out and they're like, Oh my God, what if I have all these clients? And, you know, I'm like, okay, but Oh my God, what if you have no clients? <laughs> you don't want to give that paycheck up um, until that becomes uh, an issue. And I did have one nurse who was working as a busy OR nurse manager, like these nurse managers work 70, 80 hours a week, and I was like, uh, and she's got four kids and she had a husband. I'm like, she was newly married. I'm like, really? This is what you want to do? You want to start a business? And she's like, yes, because she was the type of person that needed something more and something else and a purpose and a legacy. That Those were the, the things that she really wanted. And I'm like, well, you know, doing what you're doing is not going to get you there. So you're going to have to find time to carve out um, what you want because you're going to have to invest you are going to have to invest time and money into this dream. Um, and you have to believe that it's worth doing because if you don't believe it's not worth doing, then it's, it's not worth doing. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's a very probably understated piece of advice that Katie just shared. So if you need to rewind and listen back to it, I think you should do that because the belief and the mindset piece, I think is really from what I've seen from people that have been successful in their entrepreneurial endeavors, they genuinely believe that they're going to be able to do it. And it's not to say that they don't fail along the way, but they, you know, they maybe pivot and maybe what they thought was going to be the successful piece changes over time. What would you say, Katie, is your biggest success story that you've seen from a, from a client of yours in Nursepreneurs that has started a business and, and you've really seen them thrive and grow in that way? 
I mean, we we help nurses start IV hydration businesses, and some of those have blown my mind. Like, I'm like, what am I doing? Because what I'm doing is so much harder, or it seems so much harder, because um, some of these nurses have opened two, three, four locations. Um, you know, they are doing extremely well. Uh, I mean, I believe that they're doing better than than we are financially like that's that's how well which is great you know i'm really happy um uh, to to see that happen um but yeah to to your mindset we certainly have a you know it's like a bell curve you know we have the nurses that buy the a course or a program with us and do absolutely nothing and nothing happens and then we have the nurses who kind of chug along for six months or so trying to put the pieces together. And then we have nurses that are just like, you know, the, their belief system is they just want to get it done as fast as possible because they know what's on the other side or somehow they know what's on the other side waiting for them. Um, and they just go for it. So I had one nurse in particular who called us and she's like, you know, I took your course. And then three months later, I had like, um, she had a bunch of clients, but she had just had at that point her 1000th IV hydration client. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, like, that's, uh, I mean, that's really impressive. Like within six months, I mean, that's huge, but she's definitely an outlier. I don't, you don't see but I mean, you don't see that happen that much because I don't think people are afraid of failure. I mean, failure is just familiar, right? Not that you fail all the time, but if if you walk away from the business, you just go back to what you were doing. If you start succeeding and you have a thousand clients and you're making now you're making two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a year, you're in unfamiliar territory. You might not know who you're going to evolve into and, and uh, you know, your friends and family might not like that person. So there's a lot of unknown variables in succeeding that are pretty scary. Yeah. I think that's a really special point too. And that definitely is one that, that hits home with me. I just think of, you know, some of the personal goals and aspirations that I have, but if given the choice between something like that and, you know, the relationship I have with my, you know, mom, dad, and sister, you know, I would definitely not trade that for for that in, in terms of, you know, money or, or, you know, any type of, you know, physical or, or uh, you know, I guess, intangible piece that is not necessarily going to maybe bring you joy in the long term, like you've seen with a family or friend. And you, you talk about on your website, and we'll tag this in the show notes, nursepreneurs.com, that you believe that nurses are uniquely qualified to be entrepreneurs from the get go. You know, the detail orientation or the detail oriented aspects of, you know, the way they work, being able to get a lot of things done, manage, you know, several patients at one time and keep people safe and healthy. What have you seen, you know, since starting nursepreneurs? Have you have you seen that to be true with every person? Is there a commonality across the board with nurses like you, you know, have stated? Or do you find that some people are a little more, you know, inclined to be an entrepreneur and others maybe they try it? And realize maybe they maybe they just would prefer to to work you know in a traditional sense. Yeah, I mean this it's definitely not for for everybody. And and some we've had several nurses come to us and they're like, I just want to how do I make money really fast because uh, I'm late on my rent. And I'm like, well, this is not the place you want to be. Like, you know, if you need more money, you need to go work overtime, right? Uh, this is about an investment in your idea and your passion. And it's going to cost money. You're going to hose money for the first six months or so before you, you see return. And you have to like budget that out. Um, but yeah, I mean, nurses, I mean, we're trained uh, to to listen. We're trained to, you know, be empathetic. And these are like, these are when I went through marketing, the, the, this is the stuff they're training, teaching me. And I'm like, well, that, I, you know, I've done years and years of this type of coursework. I don't, I don't need this. Um, you know, because basically sales and marketing is um, education and persuasion. And that's what we do all day in the hospital. Uh, that's all we do. We educate the patients and then we persuade them to get in the MRI machine or, you know, take this medication or, you know, you know, let me explain to you what the doctor just consented you for surgery and uh, or what this chemo is about. Um, and, you know, they the patients and the family, they listen to you. They tell you their deepest, darkest secrets. Um, you know, I've had patients uh, that we had to like, you know, bring the girlfriend out and then bring in the wife type of, you know, scenario because like we know everything and, uh, you know, it's not our place to to judge. Uh, we just we want to look out for the best interest of, of the patients. Right. Yeah. And I think the the communication aspect, too, from nursing, I mean, coming from a pharmacy background, I certainly 
could not say enough high praise of, of the nurses that I work with and the, and the things I've seen nurses do. Really, I just always think like hats off to you, kudos. I, I don't believe that I could do that job, you know, and I, I think it really is an integrated part of the care team that, you know, I think, I think it's kind of a nice relationship, pharmacists and nursing, you know, we kind of, we kind of work together almost like patient or all, almost like business and customer within the hospital. You know, mm-hmm. the doctors and the providers, you know, PAs and, and nurse practitioners, they're also there. They're also in communication with us. But it really seems to me, it's like if I'm the pharmacist, the nurse is basically my customer, or my patient primarily throughout, throughout the workday. And so I think from a communication standpoint, both parties are pretty uniquely, uh, you know, adapted to be able to be entrepreneurs and be sales people and be able to market a product if they can build those entrepreneurial skill sets to, to get a minimum viable product from an idea. What do you think the most challenging thing is once you have, you know, your idea, you have it marketed, scaling that? What do you think the most challenging aspect of scaling a business such as, you know, like an IV, you know, type type business that a nurse could start? Or, you know, a, a piggyback question to that is what businesses can nurses start that are scalable? Oh, yeah. I mean, so, you know, I think a lot of uh, kind of the, I'll try and answer one question first, but like, I think some of the hangups uh, is that especially nursing, I, I believe we have a little bit of an inferiority complex. We uh, tend to feel like we need to be overeducated to, to prove something. And I'm a classic example of that. I've got like uh, four master's degrees, an MBA, a PhD, you know, and a host of certificate, uh, certificate, Certification, sorry, <laughs> a bunch of certifications, and uh, it was still, it was never enough, right? I could never be smart enough. I could never be enough of whatever, and I, I felt like I needed more education for everything before I could, you know, step out into the limelight and say, okay, I, you know, I've got a solution. But I didn't need all of those degrees. And one of the the things that I love is meeting like LPNs and uh, uh, associate degree nurses that come in and just blow it out of the water because business is a leveling, uh, uh, it levels the playing field, right? Because it doesn't matter what degrees you have. What matters is that you see a problem, you can articulate it, you can offer a solution, and you're not afraid to stand up and say, I have the solution, or, you know, I you know, I want to share my ideas with the world. And that takes a real leadership role. And to come out of come out from hiding. And, you know, I can only speak for myself, but I, I, I thought I was, you know, the, the unit martyr, uh, you know, I would do all this stuff and I'm like, no, no, don't look at me. Don't thank me. This is just what I do. Uh, and that was, you know, in retrospect, it was, it really hindered a lot of my ability to get leadership positions because nobody attributed anything that I did to me. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it's a big part of um, coming out into the entrepreneurial space and, and really stepping into that limelight. Yeah, and 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 specifically in regard to you know a, a nurse that has a leadership role, or you know maybe as a chief nursing officer of a hospital, do you think that that was that person had that goal in mind from the get go? Do you think most of the people that are in those roles, do you think that they just had a different confidence piece? Or I guess I'm trying to trying to tease out really what would be maybe a commonality between people that hold titles such as that. You know, there's a chief pharmacy officer at, at hospitals sometimes, and you know the qualities that you see in those people generally, it's like that. That's a good leader. You know, they certainly have the confidence, and you know they can come into a room and really kind of talk to anybody. It seems like. Yeah. No, I, I actually, it's it's funny that you said that because I'm, I'm finishing up uh, a book and an interview on this topic in particular about you know CNOs like chief nurse officers or nurses who are CEOs, like how they got to that position, and it's a mix. Like some of them are just like. I don't know. I was just there for a really long time and they kept advancing me into, you know, these different positions. And I think that was kind of the older way of how things were, you know, a lot more today. Um, we're seeing nurses with, you know, that they're going to bedside and they're like, you know what, I'm going to be the CNO. And it's so much easier to do it that way. Like if you want to be the CNO, like your pathway just illuminates all of a sudden, as opposed to, I'll oh, just show up and see what happens to me in the next 20 years, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. It's, it kind of goes back to just having like a clear goal in your mind and being able to articulate what, you know, the success piece is for you and what you're striving towards. And I think that does like that goes back to the thing we talked about already is mindset and belief. And I think that you can look at numerous examples of people that are just successful in anything in athletics or business or, 
you know, being a parent, you know, they believe that they can do it and they have that confidence in their in themselves. I also think that it kind of brings up a point of balancing confidence and ego or arrogance and you know, not definitely not throwing anything at physicians or anything like that, but there are certain, you know, type of stereotypes around, you know, physicians within a hospital system that, you know, there might be kind of that, you know, we're above other, you know, practitioners, other healthcare professionals. So not that, you know, it's across the board, but it definitely, you don't have to look far to see people that think that whether they're in nursing or not. What do you think, you know, some advice might be for someone to kind of balance that with be confident, but don't be overly arrogant or egotistical as you're maybe starting to really see success with your business that you just started. Maybe you now are making eight times the amount of money that you'd otherwise make, you know, in a traditional yeah. nursing role. Yeah. And I would say, I'll just uh, start that out with a story is that uh, I remember there was a position that had opened up and it was the director of critical care. And, you know, here I am with an MBA, PhD and lots of experience. And I'm like, oh, I think I'll, I'll apply for that. And my neurosurgeon, I'm, and I'm very good friends with my, my neurosurgeons, he was like, oh, you, you can't apply for that position. And I'm like, why not? <laughs> it's like, well, there has to be a physician in that position. I'm like, why? What makes them qualified? And he's like, well, other physicians report to that. And I'm like, so what? <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not understanding here. But, you know, the underlying thing that he wasn't saying was that the physicians wouldn't want to report to a nurse that was over them. And I was like, that is so obnoxious. Like, you know, but we haven't gotten to that point in many or most healthcare systems where the nurse is in charge. And there's there's definitely some exceptions. I mean, there's Madeline Bell, who's the CEO of CHOP, which is a children's hospital in Philadelphia. It's a massive hospital system and she's a nurse. And, you know, it's people like that that you want to, you know, showcase and elevate and, and talk about and, and give as a role model and say, you know what, if you want to do it, uh, you can't listen to other people tell you what you can't do, right? You just decide what you want and let all the noise scatter. Yeah. And that, you know, another thing that I think kind of related to that regarding nursing is, you know, from the, from the standpoint of there's so much flexibility, at least in my opinion, from what a nurse can do with their degree. You know, like you could be, you could be a nurse anesthetist and be administering the, the drugs while someone's being sedated for surgery. You know, the patient more or less is probably going to think that's an anesthesiologist unless they're told that it's a nurse. And so I right. think we're, we're getting to a point, at least in my opinion, where the playing field is kind of being leveled, where you're not, you know, it, it's, it's just an integrated team that we're, everybody's working towards the same goal. So if a nurse is the one that's most qualified to, to hold a leadership role, I don't think there should be really any, any animosity between, you know, a physician not wanting to report to them, you know, because that it's just, they're fit for the role. They're the best fit for the role. It's that's how it is in the military in particular. I know I've had a lot of military um, friends when they come out and back into like the lay system, the lay person system, they're like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> <You know>? Right, right. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that that it's kind of, you know, to have a healthy balance of, you know, healthy checks and balances within the system, I think would be would be good. And if there was, you know, maybe more of the thing that I always specifically in, in regard to pharmacy, wish that there was more of was just kind of a, a big centralized community, you know, like, like you've done with nursepreneurs. If there was a place where outside of like Reddit, where pharmacists could come and connect and talk and, you know, share opinions, both constructive and, you know, positive about work conditions. I mean, there's a lot of talk in the news now about the retail space and to, to you know, echo your point earlier about leadership, there's a ton of district managers within pharmacies that are not pharmacists. And so there's, there's pharmacists, there's pharmacy managers reporting to those people all over the country. And that's not something that, you know, I mean, it may be to a point is bothersome, but pharmacists, I think, also share that with nursing where we're not, for the most part, expecting to be like the top person in charge if we come into a hospital, which is the case in most hospitals. You're, you're not seeing a pharmacist generally as the CEO of a major hospital in the U.S. Yeah. And the question is, why not? You know, and I, you know, I think we just have to see ourselves that way um, and take over the world. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Speak it into existence. Well, Katie, <laughs> one, one, one further thing I wanted to ask you, you know, kind of as we're getting close to the, the end of our talk is walk us through your work day as an entrepreneur, as a mom to, to your son. What does a typical day look like for you? And, and really how, you know, what is your favorite aspect of being an entrepreneur more or less? 
Uh, yeah, so I mean, I get up and get my son to school. That's really the hardest part of my day. <laughs> and then everything else from there is just more kind of low key. I do, like I said, from eight until 11, I just, um, you know, I, I have a lot of thinking downtime, I'll write webinars, I'll do things that are like, only I can do. Uh, and I need that space to do it. Uh, and sometimes, like I said, I just zone out or I have this stupid um, game on my phone that I, I zone out on. Um, but, you know, it's all kind of like it, it's all good and relaxing. And then from 11 to about five, uh, I'm in a, any variety type of meetings. So on Thursdays, I do my podcast with guests, um, you know, I'm meeting with nurses who want to share their courses. So we we help them um, build out their courses and, and promote them to our audience uh, we'll meet with partners and medical directors and actually pharmacists as well. And, and uh, you know, different vendors just, you know, find looking for stuff that can help our nurses in business. And uh, then meeting with my team. We have a fairly sizable team at this point. So there's a lot of uh, one-on-one and group calls that we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I, I think it, it, it kind of just gives people an insight into, you know, the day is is probably not a standard set thing. If you're in a traditional nursing role in a hospital, you might have a very specified function that you're expecting on a day. You could, you know, wake up and have your, you know, you get your son to school and think you're going to have a day go one way and then you get a call and it spins in another way. So having that flexibility and, you know, adaptability probably is something that you've seen be important throughout your entrepreneurial journey as well. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. And, and Katie, as we, as we close here, what would you say would be the, the biggest myth that you want to debunk, either about nursing or healthcare, something that you've seen with your experience that you know is not true, it maybe is widely believed, but you want to make sure people know to, to not subscribe to that false belief. Uh, I would say um, that, you know, one, that, that the burnout is real, but I don't think the burnout is the nurses are tired of nursing. I think the nurses are tired of putting out the same exact fire day in and day out not being heard and not being respected uh, because they're frontline workers. They know, and when they they bring their concerns to management, I, yeah, I mean, really the answer is like, can you work overtime? Not like, oh my God, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. Let's, you know, let's talk about it. Let's do something about it. Uh, you know, for 20 years, we put out the same fire and I'm like, it doesn't have to be like this. Um, and it's just, it's so frustrating that you do burn out and then you see, you know, the, the classic nurse, it's like, uh, you know, they're apathetic. They don't care. It's like, that's just how I do things around here. Cause nobody cares. Uh, if, if you've ever heard that, and I've heard it a million, I've said it a million times. Um, and it's just a really crappy way to be. Um, so you don't have to live like that. Um, you don't have, there's other ways. Um, to do nursing that are be more effective and actually help the system. And, um, you know, you just have to look for them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Katie Harris, for, for being on the podcast, the founder and CEO of Nursepreneurs. We'll tag that link in the show notes as well as link to your podcast. If someone wants, wants to reach out to you, do you use any social media that would be best to, to have them go towards? Or is your website yeah. just the best resource? Uh, website, Instagram, TikTok, all Nursepreneurs. So. Fantastic. Well, Katie Harris, thanks again for joining us today. We look forward to following your journey and onward and upward for nursing. Mm -hmm.